Namaskaram. Dance Conversations was a series of symposiums that Priya Srinivasan and I curated starting in 2005 with the intention of bringing together Indian classical dancers from the diaspora together with scholars, academics and modern dancers. A rather unusual coming together. As I near 40 years of performing, teaching and presenting in Southern California, this avatar of Dance Conversations is the digital documentation of my years here and conversations with those that have contributed to and enriched my life. So welcome Priya. And I'm so happy that you were able to join us, uh, join me in this conversation as the dance conversations continue. So um, we met for the first time in 1995. And I want you to share your version of our first meeting when you came home uh, to my place in Irvine. I think that uh, you were probably in the same room that you are now. It was um, afternoon, I think, around 2 or 3 p.m. And I remember knocking on the door and uh, Lakshmi Mami opened the door. And it was just such a lovely, warm welcome. And I could hear the Tati Kuli going in the background. And she took me to this room. And that's when I saw you sitting in that corner teaching. Uh, and I slunk in around where the camera is posed right now. And I was actually seated right there. Um, when I first saw you starting to teach. That was our first encounter. That was 1995. I think yeah. it was August, August 1995. Late August, probably. I cannot believe it's been so many years now. Wow. So I, I didn't know you uh, before you came and met me here, but I know you had a very active dance uh, career in Australia. So how was the scene there in Australia before you left? And then, of course, your observations on what was going on here in America. I, yeah, so I had been dancing with a professional dance company called the Bharatam Dance Company, which uh, my dance teacher, Dr. Chandra Banu, had created and it was a pretty unique kind of experiment since it was the first fully funded um, Asian Australian dance company um, that we were actually touring and performing in all the major mainstream venues. And then when I arrived in California, I was actually a little bit shocked that such a parallel didn't exist. I just thought that, you know, um, it was strange that there was no equivalent of that at the time. And, uh, but at the same and time, not even I, now. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. Well, we've lost that here as well now. It doesn't exist. But it was interesting then to come from that kind of intense training. I was dancing like, I don't know, um, 12, 14 hours a day, maybe more. And then to come to nothing, you know, like, I just wasn't dancing and I was starting my master's, but then Kalanidhi Mami was visiting you. And so I really had wanted to learn Padams. So I thought it was a really good opportunity then to come and learn from her. And, you know, you were very open and um, that's how our, I suppose our friendship began. And I got to see what it was like uh, to see a very different guru. I suppose two gurus, you and Mami, um, both women, which I had not experienced. I mean, I did when I was younger in Calcutta. I had a teacher, Raji teacher, Raja Lakshmi, for a few years. But for most of my formative training, it had been my guru who was a man. So it was very interesting then to experience um, the way that you and Mami were teaching and to really sort of learn a different way of what teaching could look like. Hmm. So, um, you know, within a few months um, of our meeting, you were, of course, you were always asking me questions, uh, which uh, I actually like. I, in fact, I encourage my students to ask me questions because then I know they're thinking and they're analyzing. And one of the questions that you uh, that you asked that got me thinking was about 
uh, my legacy uh, because she asked me, so what have you thought about your legacy? And actually, I had not thought about it at all, but it was only, what, 10, 12 years um, since I had started teaching here. Uh, but I have thought about it a lot since. Um, and I think it has kind of evolved over the years and perhaps um, because of the years of experience uh, plus uh, maybe growing older, whatever it is, or maybe a reality check. Um, I, I kind of now at the moment, I feel like uh, my legacy has to just be uh, give whatever I can, share whatever I know with everybody and uh, create a, you know, cultural uh, landscape, an environment where these arts can thrive, even post me. And then just um, hopefully, and then just don't have expectations, you know, because uh, as you said, um, the support for the arts are, are not necessarily growing. Uh, um, and uh, I don't know if it's, it's going to be any better in our in my lifetime here, uh, though we're going to try to work and see how we can support the next generation of artists and arts uh, to thrive here. So when you came here, you came to UCLA and what were the, um, who are the people and what were the areas uh, that interest you at that time? I suppose that uh, I was really interested in why dance had become so important for me growing up. Like, why did I choose dance as a career? Um, and I was asking that question when I came, I suppose. And I think that's why I was interviewing a lot of the gurus in California. And I, I had come before earlier, but I hadn't met you then. Uh, but I had already started speaking to many of the gurus and asking them, you know, what motivated them what were their careers like? Why did they get to where they are? What did it mean to have a school? And so I think I thought my master's was going to be about that, is to look at myself, to understand my own question in relation to other people. But also I think at the heart of it was a question about the guru sishya relationship. What does it mean to um, grow through that? And you know, there's, there was a lot, there was a lot of great things that my guru gave me. Um, and a lot, and I wouldn't be who I am without that kind of disciplinary training. But there was also mixed with that forms of violence that I think that I was trying to unlearn and figure out how to deal with that uh, as I grew into myself and to actually find out, did I want to dance or did I want to have this experience of dance for myself? Or was it because of him? It took me mm. many years, I suppose, and our conversations were part of that yeah. process for me to figure out, is this him or me? You know, and what is me? If there is a me that wants to dance or understand dance, who is that? And what does that look like? Um, and I suppose encountering also Avanti at that time, Avanti Maidari, who was just finishing her dissertation it threw a bombshell in my life, as you know, uh, because I was shocked to learn that the form that I had thought was 2000 year old tradition uninterrupted was actually not and that it was actually a post colonial form that had been created through all of these different kinds of legacies and issues that had come up and learning about the Devadasis from a different perspective because all this time we had all learned that narrative, you know, these were prostitutes and that's why their form was destroyed and that's why Brahmin and upper caste women have taken these forms. And then to learn, and actually not even that, it wasn't even that. And so then to actually understand the politics of what had happened and to hear it from Avanti's thinking through, and she was unique at that time. Nobody had talked about this in that way except for Saskia Kassenboom and Amrit Srinivasan. Avanti built on that, but then she gave this such critical thinking that I remember every week after a class, I would come and ask you a difficult question. 
and sometimes you wouldn't have an answer and sometimes your narrative or answer would just be what i had what we had always already known and i would push you and say but really we have to, don't you think we have to understand these legacies differently what can we do so mm. i find it really interesting that now where are we 25 years later many dancers are finding out what we were discussing 25 years ago, Five years ago. suddenly there's an awakening now um, yeah. to this process and I and think we're going to come back to it but I think sweating saris our performance of it and also the book itself has led to many of these kinds of questions that people are asking which is really good to have been part that, of this yeah. whole process yeah we'll come back to it but i think that it is becoming more your work and and this whole uh sweating saris has become even more important now um as i i think also because more people are more accepting of what uh was at that time very unique and new work by avanti um so as we as i said we met in 1995 and we've had many 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 conversations and uh, in 1997 for the first time uh, you and i worked together on my production ritya saram in which we tried to um i mean use the repertoire not necessarily the margam format but the repertoire but to see how we can tweak it or how we can uh, play with it a little bit and um, and a lot of us uh, dancers were explaining our items uh, before you know um, before we performed it and i think for the first time at least for us uh, we did it uh, we incorporated the um the uh, the text and actually that was the first time um you had you had brought up this concept of subtext which i was doing but i didn't have a name for it i was already doing it and then you were say oh you are writing a subtext for your piece and i was like oh i guess that's what it's called because i didn't have a name for it but um i was quite actively doing it and i actually have become more and more attached to that concept now and i keep telling my all my students that is so critical in abhinayam um anyway so for um i i just wanted to uh, i anyway what do you remember from that work uh, that we did together in the tesara i remember i was really scared to tell you some of these things because i wasn't sure how your reaction would be and you know it's so nice to hear you speak this kind of theoretical language now after all these years and it's coming to you with such ease and in those days it was really tough it was very hard for you to grasp the this concepts and think about what all these things meant but it was very interesting to see when you did i think one particular piece we looked at was kalinga nardana and you know i helped work with you on how do you create the talking dance what does that look like and that was really a beautiful experience for me because for the first time i actually got to work with uh, somebody of your caliber and have these ideas tried through your body through the kinds of things you were exploring and i think it was challenging for you to speak and dance at the same time but you were able to do it and that led to you taking the kalinga nardana around schools and all your education programs this idea of what the talking dance might do and i think uh it was a very good moment to begin that and it was nice at that time to also see you start to question and experiment at the same time yeah also in ritya sar remember we did yaar kahilum where i would you know sing speak sing sing and speak alternately uh within as i performed so rather than explaining the item ahead the uh the interpretation or the um uh the meaning uh the subtext was interspersed in the performance so um it i think that was an in- interesting concept that we did at that time um i think that came from i was writing about it by that time i had gone to india and had worked with mommy for quite some time and when i came back i was exploring what does it mean that internal monologue that the dancer mm-hmm. is creating and why and how in a way the power and agency of a dancer was missing when 
you don't see that you don't see the dancer actually write the subtext you don't mm. see it unless you're another dancer so i began thinking about how do we empower dancers to have agency mm. and voice because of the fact that you know in a way that with the legacies of the devadasi tradition where many of them would sing speak and dance at the yeah. same time yeah I, i suppose what was really striking is that you were one of the few gurus who could actually sing and dance and so i thought it was fascinating to see you explore that capacity and to really think through the legacies we'd lost in the tr- uh, sort of um process of the transformation of our forms in the yeah. 20th century to understand how do we rethink the agency of the dancing body which i felt had lost a lot of power so that was a really interesting experiment we began and then we returned to it because that appeared in my master's thesis the talking oh. part of the subtext of the dance in yar kahilo and also because i had st- i had worked on it with you as a uh, learning from you the padam itself yeah. and yeah. javalis and i remember we made a contract because i said i don't want any more gurus and you said no i don't want any more students either we're good so it was a very different kind of relationship, relationship we were working yeah. with yeah absolutely um so then you moved to chicago to do your phd and how did you end up choosing the subject that you did or what triggered that uh for you so it's interesting because i i came thinking i was going to do a masters about um the the gurus and students and the guru sishya relationship and the classroom and i didn't do it in my masters thesis uh it ended up being something else altogether it looked at the padam it looked at uh, mommy it looked at you it looked at uh, the understanding who is the audience for the mm. padam and understanding the resurgence of the padam and even for my phd i thought i want to look at the dance practice in the us but then what happened as i started reading and learning and also because i saw this transformational video of ruth st dennis the mother of american modern dance doing a form and dressed in brown face um a video that i couldn't stop uh forget i, I just couldn't forget it it was so striking mm-hmm. and i and people kept telling me she didn't learn indian dance from anyone she just trained herself she went to the library and so this question really nagged and tugged me and i thought as a dancer i could really tell that there was no way she could have just made the mudras like the quality of her fingers the gestures had to have come from some kind of transmission uh, mm. between two people or more so the more i researched the more i realized well no actually there is a huge legacy that nachwali's and devadasi's had come to the us for many years even since the 1880s and ruth st dennis was you know and enc- had encountered them in coney island which then changed the face of american modern dance because she taught martha graham and so on and so forth and but then the hidden legacies of the nachwali's forms inside ruth st dennis were lost because of anti asian immigration policies so i began looking at immigration policies which then led me to look at different moments in time for south asian uh bodies on when and how they entered the us and i started looking at performers in particular and that showed me how the only reason you were there and so many others like you is because of the 1965 immigration act and what that led to was a whole different kind of class cast of dancers previous to what had existed before but that there was a whole chunk of missing time between the 1920s and 1970s where american modern dance had swallowed indian dance practices as well as many other forms at the same time including african aesthetics including um you know native american forms including other asian forms but all these became hidden because of the intersection of race immigration law um and so many other biased factors and at the same time i started looking at how do we understand the practice in the moment that we've been doing um and look back on it and that's when i also 
was able to look at um you know the the larger history of uh, the devadasi the sadar practice and what is our role now what is our responsibility now that we know these multiple legacies of what had happened on the one hand in india with a rukmini devi transforming the form and the lives and the pro- livelihoods of devadasi and sadar artists disappearing in a way and on the other hand in the us a simultaneous disappearing of devadasis and nachwalis but into white bodies and how are these two things intersecting and it was almost simultaneous right it's exactly and focusing yeah. yeah at transnational circuits but also looking at how uh, then you were actually incorporating some of these ideas in your classroom by the time i came back in 2000 and we start i started looking at your teaching much more focused in a focused way that 2000 2001 i still remember thinking how much your teaching and your practice had transformed as well so it was very interesting to see where the the sort of intersections between our dialogue what that had created for you and what what the intersections of our dialogue had created for me because what it did was it really made me think about how do i privilege the practitioner the practitioner's voice and not to lose that and so i wanted to write in a way where the dancing body was central to the work and not missing because a lot of academic theoretical work really mm. disappears the dancing body uh, and doesn't place it at front and center but i also wanted to acknowledge the um the fact of the kinds of privileges we share the way that where we are privileged and how do we account for that privilege when we're writing about these multiple histories and where are we positioned without privilege or in marginal positions and how do we understand power from that place so to really look at both sides of the equation is what ended up being my dissertation and then forming into the book sweating saris so you you say the bo- the book was published in 2012 right but we were working on it even before that isn't it when we were working with susan in la uh we're trying to create because i remember i came to rotterdam in 2013 april when we did quite a substantial part of the work but i know that even before that we had tried several times uh trying to figure out how to even get the work going you know we didn't know where to i mean i mean that was i think a interesting part and to see where we if i recall where we started uh to where it finally came i mean i don't even know how it happened but it did well i think that you got to remember when i finished my dissertation i had already gotten the job at uc california riverside mm-hmm. uh university of california riverside and i ended up moving f- 10 minutes away from you um because i really wanted us to continue what we had started and yeah. um it so i i i actually finished my dissertation after i got the job and then it took many years after that to actually write the book So yeah, all yeah. those years also while I was developing and thinking about what the book was I was also dancing at the same time but yeah. not dancing the marga I mean I'd given yeah. up that much earlier when I found out about these histories um and it was it shocked me and I you know stopped dancing the marga but what I was interested in was experimenting and that's when we started working on ganga if you remember yeah, yeah. And, in 2005 you know, actually So we worked on Ganga and I think maybe we should talk about that before we come to sweating saris. Yeah. So yeah, Ganga uh, and also dance conversations it all happened around the same time. Uh so yeah, Ganga was actually again something that you know I had read an article about uh the pollution in Ganga a few years before that and then I think it it was kind of like you said it was haunting me and i was wanting to create something but i didn't want to go to the text i didn't want to write uh, do poetry about ganga or any of that um and i just wanted to kind of create something from nothing 
and so we um, did a lot of uh, work using the Bharatanatyam vocabulary, but actually just uh, without any music, actually abstract ideas and abstract uh, concepts. And um, and you had introduced me to Dilo, and we did uh, spoken word, you know, doing Abhinayam to spoken word that she had, we had commissioned her to write for Ganga. And also the pieces that you helped me with, the adult piece with the Sholukata and um, the, you know, we had, um, I mean, it was but not wait, a post-modern to, work. But you have to remember that um, first version had a lot of uh, Chandruana's um, ideas in it too. Uh, not, it ne- had, not, not just Chandruana, but uh, the first... Not just Chandruana, I had talked to several people. Um, Dominique, and he, Dominique had Dominique, one piece that he, he choreographed. Had, that was always that. there. That was always yeah. there. That was the Aarti, yeah, the, um, the Ganga Aarti that we did at the beginning. Uh, but um, originally we had done the art forms that kind of um, evolved on the uh, banks of the Ganges. And then we completely changed it around uh, to include only spoken word and the other pieces that that we I had set up, you know. But using you know the what was interesting? That's when you made me do that uh, Odyssey piece on Ahila. <laughs> I just was like, oh my god, that was so interesting um, to do it in that context because I hadn't created a um, classical piece on anyone in a really long in time. Years. So that was really interesting because I've been doing a lot of experimental work. <laughs> really interesting because I loved meeting Dilo and I just thought you know why 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 can't we and this is still going along the thing where I was trying to think about what the talking dance would look like an interruption and what does it mean to have the dancers speaking so it was really really wonderful to try that with the Ganga dancers and how much fun it was working with them um, it was absolutely fun it It was was really fun yeah, yeah, it was really great. It was a really good experience. And I mean, I and I think ever so often I like to have um, to step outside the box and do something which is scary. Um, and uh, because you don't, um, it's not set in a framework that you're comfortable with. Uh, so it was, um, it was experimental and scary and fun all at the same time, you know. And but you know it, what it, you would do? I don't know if you remember this. We would show mommy a version of it, and mommy would be like, "In the corner, me puri la." She'd be like, "I don't even understand what you're doing." And then you'd have a freak out. You'd be like, "Oh my god, mommy doesn't understand what I, what we're doing," and you'd be like, "We can't do it like this. We've got to go back." No, no, no. And then we'd be like, "Okay, slowly, we stopped mommy from coming." And then she wouldn't give us the feedback, and we would just continue to, so we could keep exploring. But I think that I think around that time was when we decided to do dance conversations as well. That was the first iteration. Um, yes. And I I think I had just had Rishi, and we decided to, or I was pregnant with Rishi. I don't know. I can't remember. But we had. It, where, no, Rishi when was, was the baby. first dance. Okay. Two thousand five. Yeah, okay. That yeah, was yeah, Indian. Was I mean, we decided we'd keep it small and call it Indian Dance in California, past, present, and future. You know, we had Medha Yod, 
uh, who was one of the early uh, practitioners of Bharatanatyam in 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 America, possibly. She, I think, she came here in fifty nine, fifties, sixties, early sixties, and then we had um, Dr. Brown, uh, uh, you know, who uh, brought the film about Balama and her early visits to U.S. and her tours, um, and then of course we had all the. Um, Major gurus in California coming. That was huge, yeah. right? That was yeah. Not the only first. that, and also we all performed, which is a huge, even bigger thing to have everybody perform on the same stage um, and and just just be in a conversation, right? So that was really special. Um, and then of course um, we had three more, but four, I would say, half and half. We had. 2013, 2015, and 2016 uh, theaters and dance. What do you remember about that? Is that when we brought Maya Krishna Rao, and we also had um, uh, Hari Krishnan, and we had um, uh, Joanna from uh, Germany, and we had. So many people come and be part of the conversation. That was very different. What we did that time we around. We also had a lot it? of local people, local non-traditional dancers of the next generation, right? The yeah. American. We had a lot of the post-Natyam people. Yeah, youngsters. actually, we had post-Natyam even the first time. Yeah, yeah. When but they were just actively forming. involved. Yeah, but more actively yeah. involved in 2013. Yeah. We featured them and their work, and then Ketu as well came yeah. and was a part of that. That was uh, yeah, that was really interesting, and also um, and also that was I the first time we collaborated with UC Irvine with Dr. Uh, Joe Lewis, you know, who was the dean at that time, and he was kind That's enough right. to yeah, kind enough to collaborate with us and present it at UCI. Um, which was really nice. Yes, you know. that was a moment because we wanted that. I, I really felt that it was really important to have the university connections to make the work, you know, um, reach a broad audience and how do we have more gravitas to it. So that was good. And I think also um, in, it's interesting, one of the things I'm thinking about as we're saying this is I think that I was also uh, experimenting on form right as all this was happening but i didn't do it to the south asian audience but you know most uh -huh. of it was being done to a non-south asian audience i was doing it in you know museums and galleries and um, conferences and things like that and not really exploring this idea of where the book had started to develop because it always for me the book was back and forth I would mm. try an idea out and then I would perform it. Then I would go back and rewrite it. But I think around 2012, 2013 is when I felt, when when the book got that award, the M, uh, Emery Elliott Award, and we started for the first time, we actually performed together yeah. At, yeah. The, at the award ceremony because I felt, it. I think I felt that by that time, I was worried that dancers wouldn't read the book. I felt yeah. like it was always just going to be with academics. Academics. You know, yeah. but in 2013 yeah. was the year that um, dance conversations also took a different track and yeah. a different angle. And then when yeah. we did it again in 2015, right, was yeah. when we did it at the Bill Barber Park. 2016. 2016. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So 2015, I, I, I couldn't make it. Yeah. 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 So I want to also say that 2005, we not only did we have the, all the dancers, uh, prominent uh, Indian classical dancers in California, but we also had all the professors from UCLA, UC Riverside, True. UC Irvine, True. Um, yes. all of them who were, you know, uh, pretty well known in the academic uh, world. Uh, so that was really special to have everybody in the same room in a conversation. Susan Rose was That's there, a good Jennifer point. Fisher, and yeah. who else from UCLA? Um, David Gear. David Gear was there. And uh, a couple of more, right? From UCLA. Yeah. And when we so came from UC Riverside and Anthea, so there was yeah. a lot of 
different people because again we wanted um to bring the theoreticians the academics and the dancers together that was our yeah. goal even then and probably it was the first and so far the last time it's happened sadly <laughs> in 2015 no i don't think so no ramya i mean think about it when we did sweating saris the tour it yeah. was we ended up doing it in both um mainstream institution theaters and yeah. we did it in universities and that's where we yeah. had the mixing of the academic and the dancer crowd right yeah 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 but i'm just saying but in a conversation well yeah at the post performance conversation yes we did yeah so 2015 was uh, dancing communities and dancing cities when you know you couldn't come unfortunately and we had one part which was sharad with kanik's um, kanikeshwar and working with the local community the musicians and the music department at uci again very very uh nice event um to not only have the music of two different music systems come together but also two different institutions from the ekta center as well as uci you know come bring the communities together so that was really nice as well and then 2016 is when you came and we finally did the uh first a uh, premiere i should say of sweating saris finally after i've yeah. been working on it for many years and kind of presenting different parts of it and then finally we had kind of strung it all together into a 60 mm. minute 65 minute piece right but it was also uh the time when we worked with a site specific works where we yes. had uh some of your dancers some of the contemporary dancers from UCI and other community IVC colleges IVC. Yeah, yeah IVC and also um Susan helped and uh she and I did that piece with those dancers at the Bill Barber Park yes and people were it was a moving performance and people could amazing. come and yeah and then there was like that uh piece that then they came to the square and you had the bharatanatyam performances happened there and then they went in and we had the sweating saris piece I, uh, inside in the in the in the law office was it a judge or court it was a it, court no, of law it was law. just city hall it was just city hall city hall yeah yeah it was the city hall i mean i i mean when i think back i think wow it's actually about 4 years now and i think uh, it's It was really special to have, you know, this is something that I've always thought about where the audience moves with the performance rather than uh the um so the, you know to have them move to three different locations to watch the performance to for I think that was really unique and special. And then I think also it's interesting when I when we talk about this I realize how much I was growing and shifting and changing because I had left California in 2008. I had moved to China. I lived yeah. and did stuff in China for 5 years. Then I moved to Holland. And <laughs> all of these ideas in a way that I was gathering in other places and experimenting, it was really good to be able to share that with you and have you work with me to trial it in with a company with dancing dancers um of the kind of training. So yeah, I really have to thank you for uh opening yourself to doing that kind of work 
in a way so that we could actually keep evolving and keep growing mm-hmm. and moving uh, so that it, the journey was um I, when you when we spoke, I realized, oh, the moving thing was something I had started to develop in Shanghai, one of the projects that I did, did with the Rock Band Art Museum. And then I worked mm-hmm. with a um, Susan, who you I don't think you ever met, a different Susan, um, mm-hmm. who I did work with uh, in Holland when I lived in Holland with this, com- with this group called Moving Matters. And mm-hmm. we used to do a lot of really interesting work in museums and galleries. So around the same time, I think when you were in Holland is when we finally actually got Sweating Saris uh, going. When I came and spent 10 days and we worked at Corso and we did a couple of uh, uh, trial runs, uh, work in progress runs with audiences there, which which is again something I don't think happens in the US, at least not in this part of the US. You have to acknowledge Ruth St. Dennis, the mother of American modern dance, who was influenced by the Indian dancers and dance in the early part of the 20th century. Do you not remember the tight embrace that we had? And acknowledge the match values who carried these traditions from the Indian soil to the American shores, the first Indian dancers in America. Namaste. And you met all the, you met all the, um, um, the Suriname dance community, Indian with the, dance community. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sadia Bunstra. Uh, no, no. Wait, what was her name? Do you remember that teacher who was so taken with what we were doing, and she came? And I even have a photo. I think I sent a photo of her with us. Uh, I'll have to find out what her name is so we can remember. But she was so like uh, um, taken with what we were doing, and they found it really strange and interesting how we were developing it and always we were working with Susan online offline in the night you know in the night (laughs) we would do record what we worked on and then have a like a a session with her in the night Um, and she would critique it and give us ideas and share thoughts so yeah I I think maybe we we started in 2012 and I suppose we continued it, building with gaps here and there over time. And probably yeah, in you, 2015. We were, yeah, we were separated, right, by distance. And so there was only when we were able to meet, we were able to work on it. And um, I think it took its own life and it kind of came alive um, I don't know how at the moment, but uh, what exactly we did, but I really did enjoy it. And I liked the challenge, uh, though it was overwhelming for me because it was really stepping away from uh, what I was comfortable and what I had been doing all those years. But I really liked the challenge and liked the, I always love collaborating with people. So uh, and also just stepping out, you know, going off the beaten path and expanding my horizon and being able and yet trying to keep the traditional elements and kind of blending them with new ideas and new concepts. Right. And also to expand the 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 audience's views of, I mean, whatever you had learned and whatever you had shared with me and your work, and it it was a nice way, in an entertaining way, to educate the audiences, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting um, that we, for me, that working on the Sweating Saris with you took a different dimension, because I had been developing it on my own um, when I was in uh, mm-hmm. Europe, and I had taken it to different places. Um, but it was very interesting when you and I started working together and the dialectic that developed, um, I, I don't know, I found it really uh, 
w very satisfying and worthwhile probably because it by that time it by the time we did it in 2015 um we had known each other for 20 years and i finally felt comfortable performing on stage with you and probably not until then did i feel comfortable dancing with you you know it's so interesting i i i i had this other life i suppose that when i was with you where i was not dancing but i would be the choreographer i would be the thinker but i never actually danced with you mm -hmm. or for you and i never actually asked you to ever i never said to you with all the shows you were doing i never said why don't you feature me in a performance it, i never had that thought at all but it was in 2015 when we actually did it together that i really felt the power of what you brought and i actually understood what my contribution was and all these years it took that long for me to find yeah. myself in a way you know to get to that point and then i thought it was really interesting when we developed it further um and we did it uh you know both in holland and we got you know so interesting feedback from corzo's directors at that time for the work and then we also did it um in LA the following year then we took it to India right in 2017 yeah. January yeah, uh, we performed it at spaces 2018 yeah wait before we come to Melbourne aren't we going to talk about our southern california tour briefly sure Do you remember of, of sweating that? sweating sarees yeah you you've forgotten that you can't forget S that i mean the response that we got in the bay area for example with all the gurus yeah. who attended and all these dance dancers and dance people were just like blown away and couldn't believe this kind of history and the panels yes. that we had right the panels where you spoke to with uh scholars and we also had local gurus da and teachers dancers, yeah and in seattle exactly and, we did you know, what we did stanford university we did the bay area that usha had organized uh, where yeah, all the gurus Prusangam. and everyone came and yeah. then we also went to um seattle which Sandy was excellent university of and, washington yeah and we did highways in in los highways angeles highways and san diego state in san diego yeah so. but you know why i'm bringing that up is because i I've, i've had quite a few of those dancers who attended the show then which was april 2018 come yes. to me now in this moment and say to me that was tr that really changed my thinking about dance i didn't still understand fully what you were saying but now 2 years later with everything the way it is in covid and i have time to read i have time to think i'm actually mm -hmm. rethinking some of those questions you asked and i think mm -hmm. that to me is really the success of the work that we did is when people were changed and transformed by it and Absolutely. it forced them to ask questions years later even if they didn't get it fully then but to come to it years later and say oh my god now i understand what you were trying to say but i didn't then yeah i mean that was our intention wasn't it anyway to yeah make people think uh, at some point <laughs> But I think yeah. it was also one of the few times people heard you sing mm. on, by your like you were singing and dancing and people found that really quite beautiful when you did Yara Ka Hilom and why I come back to that is because that's the journey we took over 20 years or more of Yara Ka Hilom by Ma and the way that it transformed from mommy teaching it to me you teaching it to me me putting it into the thesis it then coming into the PhD into the book and then reperform back on your body with my interaction i think mm -hmm. that is like remarkable you know just one piece yeah. it's journey over 20 to 25 years Absolutely. and the effect that it had on an audience yeah and also had an important sentiment right that we need to be fearless <laughs> so yeah so yeah i so, yeah. i mean those were good good uh, trips and good uh, performances and good conversations with a lot of interesting people and diverse 
groups of people, you know, scholars, Diverse audiences. Dancers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was really nice. So, um, and I coming suppose back- it, to where I am now, I think mm-hmm. that after I moved back to Australia five years ago, um, I really felt that what I had grown up and the kind of, um, uh, opportunities that I had as a dancer were just not present for dancers here. And there was no more arts in the mainstream, which I had grown up in, believing that I was part of that process. Mm. And so I kind of felt like I really needed to change things here. And then in the end, I had to be the change that I wanted to see. So after writing my book, getting tenure at the University of California, you know, I, I resigned and I gave up that job and everyone was like yelling at me saying, are you crazy? What's wrong with you? But then I took that back and I suppose here what I've done is tried to intervene between the arts sector to bring the mainstream and the minority communities together where South mm-hmm. Asian art has just been literally relegated to the suburbs and the mainstream art forms are in the main prestigious um, you know, um, theatres and mm-hmm. getting all the funding and everybody else is on the margins, not just South Asians, but all other forms are literally on the margins. So I wanted to shift that and I really wanted to create a different way of um, opportunities for the next generation. Coming back to legacy, one of the reasons I asked you about legacy is I, I really was tr- trying to think how do we think outside the box of ourselves? You know, as dancers and especially as soloists, you get mm-hmm. so caught up in yourself and your ego and your persona and what you need to create. But I just felt watching you over those years, the way that you taught, the kind of broad thinking, the invitation to so many other artists, perf- having them perform, creating avenues for them and being in conversation and learning from them and growing that was what I was asking you about your legacy. Like, how did you see that going to the next generation? So using all of those things and, you know, the developments that happened over the years, I wanted to think about what is the legacy for those people here. And really, that's why I ended up creating Sangam, um, which is the South Asia Performing Arts Festival um, mm-hmm. for Diaspora, to actually give a real sort of serious um, space and avenue with funding, production values, how do we actually use that for the generations that follow, but also cut across the divide between what is contemporary, what's traditional, how do we shift those understandings of what is contemporary and what is traditional and give them the same platform and also what we call popular or, you know, um, forms of Bollywood and hip hop Mm -hmm. and all of that, spoken word, comedy, theater. How do we bring all of that together under one platform? So that's why I created that with uh, two other people, Uttra Vijay and Hari Sivanesan, two musicians, uh, one who is Sri Lankan and one who is Indian background, but to actually cut across all of these challenges we faced and to give opportunities, um, like in a way how you had created Ekta, uh, you know, to really bring unity. This is about that. Uh, But also Mm. in Australia and in particular in Melbourne, the vision really has been, you know, people said to me, well, if you want to see the change, you have to be the change that you want to see. And so I I really had to take on performing again in a very different way than I had imagined before. And probably the strength and the courage that I started getting confidence in myself, which I had lost over time, because I was also not sure as I was trying to figure out how do you respond to this Devadasi question? How do you respond Mm -hmm. to this history that has shattered and is at the heart of everything we've done? but do it in a responsible way. What is it that we can do? And it really did take me 15 years or, you know, uh, to figure it out. And even now I haven't figured it out. None of us have, but performing, traveling extensively, performing in um, India and Europe, um, in the US and um, here started to really crystallize for me what that change needed to look like. And then I really started pioneering and working with First Nations artists, uh, which people had not done before in a way. And so 
it really started taking the work to the next level um, and to think, you know, how do we use the India-Australia connections as well, diplomacy, how do we use diplomatic connections to mm. really push the next generation to that next level. But really the goal has been how do we get these next generations of artists confidence to become artists and to step exactly. into themselves um, yeah. because there's also the fear of, you know, very sort of racist thinking. Our forms are not as good. We don't have the capacity. We don't know how. So really all the workshops, all the mentoring, the training, everything that we're putting into Sangam, which thankfully we've got excellent funding from the Victorian government and also other funding bodies are slowly coming together. We have partner venues, mainstream venues. Can you imagine? Four mainstream <laughs> venues, all partnering and producing and really being a part of this movement of change. It's been really rewarding and really wonderful sure. to see what's I'm possible. Sure. That's wonderful, Priya. So I'm glad that, you know, you're finally home and you're doing what you want to do and also making a difference. Ultimately, that's what it's about, right? Like you said, um, for whatever reason, I have not been able to just think of just me as, you know, individually what I want to uh, do. But actually, how does what I do make a difference in the community, into the next generation? So thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. It was fun to revisit all our um, our life together for the last I mean, it's been strange because you've not been here that much, but still we've been connected in some weird sort of way. So thank you again.